I mean, the most challenging aspect is getting people to sort of, you know, say, well, maybe elevations of LDL cholesterol in the context of every other risk factor dramatically dropping as a net net as a net improvement. Um, and then, and of course, obviously, we've got some studies that are ongoing that may show this high cholesterol in the context of a low carb diet is not increasing risk for heart disease, which is still vehemently debated. And so, mm-hmm. you know, until that issue goes away, it's going to be a, kind of this battle. And I think it's unfortunate because I don't know how many people sit there with autoimmune disease or chronic pain or depression, which would otherwise go away if they were, if they were just consume a, a meat-based diet and, and, and maybe their cholesterol would, would go up. And, and I don't know, it seems like, you know, when we talk about do no harm, are we keeping people in a chronic state of misery just to avoid a theoretical outcome, which may or may not, may not eventuate. So oh, yeah. kind of my a, favorite, um, my favorite patient that was like a convert to my way of thinking who actually like went back to her other doctor and was like, you need to listen to this, um, was a patient that was actually heading towards kidney failure. Um, like her EGFR was like 60 on the nose. She had a couple other markers that were off too. And I actually put her on carnivore took away all the carbs she was eating. Her EGFR went back up to like 80 and she's like, I thought protein was bad for my kidneys. No carbs are bad for your kidneys. We're going to, and so we completely reversed that process for her. And she was like, okay, I'm, I'm sold on this. Yeah. That's a, that, and that's a great anecdote. I'm glad you brought that up because that is always another criticism. Well, high protein diets are going to harm your kidneys, which is not in any way, shape or form grounded in actual solid evidence. It's all this, well, failing kidneys spill protein. Therefore, that's not why they, that's not why they're failing. It's just, a, it's just a marker that they're failing. And, uh, you know, guys like David Unwin in the UK is his, he's actually published a study out there looking at diabetics with, with chronic renal disease. And they show they actually improved when you remove the carbs and added more protein in. So, I mean, it's a, it's an interesting situation where it's a lot of education, even among a lot of physicians that, that, you know, it's stop learning or their education is funded by the, by the drug rep that the, the, the cute drug rep that brings the, brings the food or whatever. And, and here's a study that we funded that we want you to read and know about and prescribe to your patients. Where do you see your practice going over the next few years? Because it's interesting, you know, a lot of us are now on social media and we're finding that our reach is amplified. Whereas, you know, with, with the standard brick and mortar thing, you know, you can only see how many patients can you see a day? 12, 20. I, I used to see 50 a day as an orthopedic surgeon, but was I, re- I mean, five minutes, you know, how much time do you, how much can you actually do in a five minute visit? Not much. But uh, where, where do you, what do you want? What do you hope to do over the next coming? I don't know, five years, ten years. Yeah, I mean, I still, you know, I, I do a lot of procedures, so I think that I'll still maintain doing that. Um, but ultimately, as far as getting people healthy, what I'm actually just starting with, literally, I have a group starting uh, in on January third, is just doing group based health programs to just teach people a lot of these principles, guide them through the changes that they need to make for their diet, and then have me there to support them in a you know a really meaningful way, right? With the medical background, the naturopathic background, the the carnivore, the whole the whole holistic background, um, and I think this is going to allow more wide scale changes for people that really need it, who can't see me in person, who may not have a doctor that's nearby to them that can actually help them in in this type of way. So um, the program that I'm starting up in January, it's geared more towards women and it's actually helping them navigate um, fat loss and better body composition using a lot of the carnivore principles, but also talking about things like you know, using food to naturally balance your hormones, how to help your body, you know, rid itself of certain toxins and, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, I just wanted. There's a comment here from Candace saying that her kidney function was 60 percent prior to carnivore. Now it's fully recovered, which is just another, another, another just sort of. And people are always just an anecdote, but there are thousands and thousands of these at this point where you can't ignore it anymore. Um, mm-hmm. Let me ask you again. Uh, you know, as as a as a woman, a fitness competitor, a lot of women these days are seeing. You know, we see that in this younger generation, they are the most likely to buy off on the eat fake meat, drink almond milk or soy milk or whatever, or oat milk or whatever stuff. What, what message do you have for those? Because you, you kind of went through that process yourself. What, what, do you, what would you say to those folks? Man, I'm, I think about that. Like, what would I have said to my younger self in this position? And it's so tricky because I feel like a lot of things had to compound and I had to feel as bad as I did to want to see a different side. Um, and it's so funny. I act, we actually see this because we have a, a our babysitter for our children, she's on that 
path right now. And I think the biggest thing is just leading by example, like be the example, show your successes, show what you're doing in a way that seeks to educate, not to shame. And I think that's, that's a big difference. And um, that's honestly why I like the idea of doing group programs, because what I actually encountered in my clinical practice was that people would see my results and sometimes it might seem a little bit intimidating to them. And when you're one-to-one with a patient, it's a serious level of intimacy for somebody to come and like bear all their stuff to you. And also to have you narrowed in and focused on them with all your knowledge. And it can be, it can be difficult for them to actually sit in a place and and take that in and actually take what you're saying and run with it. Um, Whereas when you're in a group program, you're just generally teaching. People can take what they take. It's not directed specifically at them, um, but I feel like it makes the content a lot more digestible. So using social media, using platforms to just share this stuff and hope that it lands in the right person's hands and that the right people are even just sharing that with their loved ones that they know are going through something like this. It's We just got to keep up the work. Yeah. The, the group aspect is very, the community aspect, the group aspect is really important because, you know, when you, when you're, in, when you're just by yourself, you feel alone. It's like, well, I, I, you know, but then you have 25 people saying, Hey, look, I did this and work. And, you know, and, and it, it really, really, uh, you know, gives people a lot of comfort that, that they're not alone in, in this type of uh, situation for sure. Um, what are your, I mean, outside of diet, you know, what are the other things that we need to pay attention to? Oh, sleep. (laughs) Your body can't heal unless you're sleeping. And this is something that I actually teach my patients a lot too. Like sleep is a skill, you know, sleep is a skill, just like thinking is a skill, just like eating is a skill, just because you can do it and that you do it every day doesn't mean that you're doing it correctly. Um, You know, you have endless amounts of people that lay in their bed at night, just scrolling on their phone and that's screwing up their deep sleep. It's screwing up their melatonin production. And all of that is going to have a cascade of effects, right? Because we heal when we sleep you're not sleeping, you're not healing, and you need to be doing that consistently in order to make any meaningful changes in your life. So I really do drive that home for a lot of people as well. And then of course, movement, right? I don't think everybody needs to be doing intense levels of like weight training, resistance training, hit exercises every single day. But I think that most people need to be moving their body in a way that feels good and that they can do sustainably. And I think that's, what's going to actually contribute to the better body composition that they're likely looking for versus just, you know, fat loss, for example. Where do you think healthcare is going in the, in the next 10 years? Are we going to see more and more of this lifestyle stuff? Are we going to just see just complete everybody's obese, everybody's on drugs. What are your thoughts? I think there might be like an equal convergence. Honestly, I think that the cool thing about social media is that you cannot avoid the fact that there are doctors like us out there trying to really post content that actually helps people and tries to really change their approach, their way of eating. And I'm sure like you, I get DMs all the time from people that I didn't even know or follow me that were like, Hey, you posted this thing and this is the results that I got from that. And you just, you never know who's watching. You never know who you can impact. So I think that that's going to be a really big, big positive, but you still also have the whole subset of the, the world that really doesn't even seek that out, right? They don't even want to consider any other option. They don't even know that it's available and you're still going to have them continuing to, to play into that model. And I think you honestly, you brought up a really good point with your, you know, your anecdote about the patient in the cortical steroid injection is that no healthcare professional gets into healthcare because they don't want to help people, especially as physicians, right? We don't spend a decade plus killing ourselves in school, going into six figures of debt because we're trying to not help people. Um, but what gets lost in the way is that, you know, like your hands are probably tied by what insurance is going to pay for or by what is acceptable or by what's not going to get us reported to the board um, or what's not going to set us up for a malpractice claim, right? And so there's still doctors in, that are keeping their hands tied by that. And that's why we're still going to see the convergence that way. But I think we can still continue to build the momentum in the other way. And I hope just it eventually catches fire and that people just want to move the whole other direction. 